Step outside. So a very good evening to everyone. Welcome. Uh, Indigenous Ways acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Turtle Island and pays its respect to their elders past and present. We want to take this time to acknowledge traditional owners and ancestors of these lands we reside on here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, our Pueblo people, and wherever you're beaming on, in, from, and acknowledging the traditional owners and ancestors of the lands where you're at so we could be here today. Thank you. And Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally. This is a fabulous platform for that. So in that way, we have a lot of gratitude that we're able to stay connected. And uh, we started our virtual platform on April 1st, 2020, so that we could stay connected during these challenging times of the global pandemic. And we have been able to support over 70 uh, Native American, Indigenous, LGBTQIA2 plus artists, musicians, and presenters at our Wisdom Circle, which is every Wednesday at this time, along with the third Saturday of each month at three o'clock in which we host a concert series. Thank you all for sharing this space with us, whether you are live in our Zoom or in one of our many social media platforms or watching a recording of this. Thank you. Your time is precious and valuable to us. And uh, this evening we are so blessed to uh, <coughs> present our beautiful guest, Corita Coffey, who hails from the Comanche tribe. There's so much about the Comanches that we don't know because it was never written down. But you know what? What is, what is known is from the original caretakers of those lands out of Oklahoma. And Corita comes from that tribe, so Corita has a lot more information about the Comanches through her oral uh, traditions and heritage and what's been handed down to her, along with uh, just uh, being involved in, in this country the way it's been. So uh, for that, we're very grateful to have uh, Corita. She's our second Comanche uh, presenter this year. So uh, Terry Gomez was our first uh, uh, artist uh, playwright that came in. So Corita is a uh, wo woman of many, many skills and many talents and has a very beautiful, intense, educated, critical thinking skills that I've always looked up to and uh, I've actually always looked up to Corita. I've known her for many years. So uh, without me saying too much more, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand hand it over to Corita, everybody. Let's give it up for Corita Coffee. Woo! Woo Welcome, Corita. Okay, Thanks. so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of my background. <clears throat> um, Southwest Oklahoma is my first home. Uh, most of you know, or some of you know, I live here in New Mexico and have lived in New Mexico uh, 38 years. So, um, but I, I want you to know that Oklahoma is my first home. Um, specifically, I, I grew up on land that was north of a small town called Faxon. Um, in southwest Oklahoma. I'm from the Yabaruka band of the Comanche Nation. Some say Yapai. It's a shorter way of saying it. Um, and my Indian name is Tsat de Mo'ogat, which means good with her hands. I was giving, given that when I was about 12, 13 years old. And I have no idea how they knew I would be doing art. Uh, I don't know how they do that, but that's the name uh, that was given to me. I am a descendant of Tin Bears, once a Comanche chief of the Yapurukas. Um, 
And I grew up on my grandfather's 160 acre allotment signed by President McKinley in 1901. That area was known as the Kiowa Comanche Reservation until it was opened up. Um, there were millions of acres opened up to non-Indians. Non so they split up our reservation and it's kind of a checkerboard. Um, Eli Coffee Huvaruka, another way to say it is Huvaduka. Duka means eat. Uh, <clears throat> so Huva is coffee, coffee eater. That's how I got the name coffee. It became a translated name. Uh, was born in the mid 1800s. And Elena has a photograph of my grandfather that she will put up somewhere. Um, my mother and my brothers lived with my grandfather in a house that was built sometime before 1907. I feel very fortunate to have known my grandfather. I only remember him speaking Comanche and I believed that as he aged, he chose to only speak Comanche. I mean, he certainly knew how to speak English because he had been in the non-Indian world for a number of years. He left this world in 1954. My grandmother did, I didn't know my grandmother. She did not have a long life. Uh, very few Comanches had long lives in the early 1900s. And this is probably true with other native people. She passed away when my mother was 14, probably from tuberculosis as did eight of my uncles and aunts. And Elena, can you show the second photo? So that's my grandfather. And then this is my grandmother and my mother, my mother's in cradle board. My mother was born in 1907 and she was one of the last original allottees. Children got 80 acres and that's what she got in 1907. Did I already say she was born in a birthing teepee? I, I have no idea what, okay. what that's like, but. Um, so on the Comanche, I'm on the Comanche tribal roll and on that roll, I'm considered a full blood. My mother and my father who left when I was a toddler were both Comanche. But I will tell you that I am one eighth Mexican, and that could be a uh, Mexican Indian because my tribe went on raids and they took captives. Um, my mother's grandfather was the Mexican captive. So I consider myself to be living history and not too many full bloods, full blood Comanches admit to being anything else. Um, so my grandfather, Huboroka, had four wives, two at one time in the early 1900s. One of them was my grandmother, and the other was my grandmother's sister. Some Comanches won't reveal this in their histories because of Christianity. But again, it's living history. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, many Native Americans still lived in the country, in what I call the natural world, on trust land. I mean, this was true in Oklahoma. My ancestors lived in the natural world, and they considered it sacred. It's part of our legacy. Growing up in the country, in the natural world, which means no electricity, 
no running water, is very different from today's indoor urban environment. And I'm mentioning this because I feel it shaped my identity and it shaped my artwork. Any questions? Nope. Nope. nope, so far so, so far, good. So good. Great, Great stuff, Corita. Um, well, I went to public school. My mother did not want to send me to boarding school because many, many young Comanches went to boarding schools from grade one up. That was the way back then. But she chose to send me to public school in Faxon and then public school in Lawton, Oklahoma. My mother sold her land and with that money, we moved into Lawton, which to me was a city. Uh, I'm a country girl and uh, it was, it was very different. And actually I didn't know that we were poor until we moved to this small city because where I grew up, everyone was poor. They lived off the land. Um, in public school, I did take art courses and uh, in junior high, I took art courses. And one year in high school, I took art courses. So somehow with my Indian name, I, I don't know if that guided me or somehow Edgar Monatachi, who gave me my Indian name, knew something about my future. I'm going to go into talking about IA. Okay, yeah, Karita, thank you very much. Uh, we would really like to hear about your history at IAIA as a student. That is just absolutely amazing history that you have. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, you're welcome. I, I might mention in um, grade school in Faxon, back then we had three grades in one room. <laughs> That's unheard of today, but three grades in one room. And I don't remember much about it, uh, except tasting paste, you know, which I'm sure that maybe others have tried. Uh, it was that white, thick paste. And I don't remember learning to read, except that I may have learned before I got, well, I, I learned by watching my brother when he was learning to read and from the light of the kerosene lamp. And so um, that was part of learning to read too. Wow, that's awesome. That what I remember about uh, tasting anything was tasting dirt <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> well, you know, do you remember the mud puddles and sometimes when they dried up, it looked like chocolate? Oh yeah. Have you ever yeah, seen that? We've got those stories. Hey, Diane Reyna, welcome. Awesome, Karita. So yeah, tell us about I, your history at IA as a student. How did you uh, get into that? Well, let me find, I've got all these papers here, sorry. Um, I actually, in the summer of 1963, went to the Interdarko Agency, which is, you know, the BIA, and applied to go to Haskell. Now, some of you might know, I mean, I think it was called Haskell Institute back then. Well, their dorms were full. So they said, wait, we got this new school. And they told me about the Institute of American Indian Arts, which was a high school and a postgraduate program. Hmm. So actually, it was a fluke. 
getting to IAIA, which is what we call it, the Institute of American Indian Arts, um, was not my plan. Um, I always feel it was my destiny, but it was not my plan. So it turns out that um, I came to Santa Fe to IAIA in 1963. Um, and I was in the 11th grade, I was barely 16. And it was the school's second year. Now, most of you know, or some of you know, like Diane and Thomas, that, that the Institute of American Indian Arts was founded by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the native faculty, and Elena can show the faculty photo, the native faculty were all recruited to teach at IAIA. So some of the native faculty was like Atali Lolama, you see her in the front row, and then Josephine Wapp, she's also in the front row in a buckskin and she's Comanche. Oh, There's wow. Rich Shoulder who, and I don't know, he, he was a California tribe. Back then they used to say Mission Indian and I don't even know what that meant. Um, I'm sure there's a different name today. And um, there's a painting teacher in the background, Neil Parsons, and then Lloyd New is in the middle. Um, Lewis Ballard is in the back. He taught music. And uh, also Alan Hauser is in the back. Mm. These were the teachers at that time. Wow. Amazing. Now, Ralph Partington is the man perched up high and he taught ceramics. He was my teacher. Um, so the IA was founded in 1962. And as I said, it was a high school and postgraduate program accredited within the state of New Mexico. So we had all these other requir uh, requirements like math and English. Um, and when I first arrived to IA, there were approximately 300 to 400 students between the ages of 15 and 23 from about 88 different tribes. Imagine that. I don't know if I could deal with three or 400 students between the ages of 15 and 23. Oh, wow. um, and students were distributed geographically from all over the US, including Alaska. And this was actually my first Indian education, was learning about these different tribes from them. So other students would tell me about their tribe and they would tell me maybe stories from their tribe. So that was part of my, I consider that part of my education. And that I think is true today uh, with students at IAIA. I think they talk to each other about where they come from and so on. So the art education program back then had many different disciplines in the arts. Uh, we were free to pursue our interest with whatever materials we chose. And we were encouraged to express our feelings about who we were and how we perceived our Indianness. Um, and it was during this time at the age of 16 that I first touched clay. Uh, we actually had a course in our orientation program that made us go through all of the arts. Being young, and many of us had, hadn't experienced these different disciplines, so we had to go through each of them. And when I got to ceramics, it was the first time I touched clay, <clears throat> and it was love at first touch. Oh, wow. Um, I knew then what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Mm. So I was indeed lucky to know my calling at such a young, young age. Wow. Um, I did not come from a clay culture. Comanches were nomadic. Mm. And the last thing they wanted to do was to pack up and drag around big clay pots. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, they couldn't do that. They broke down their TP, the camp, and and moved in no time. Um, I'm still amazed today putting up a TP, how quickly you can put that up and make it really tight. Um, so clay was not part of my culture. And because of that, I felt I was free to do anything I wanted in clay. The art world was wide open to me. Um, I graduated from IA in 1965, but I will say that the Institute was vital to my creative development wow. and that and vital to many other Indian artists. Mm. From this legacy, legacy of Institute artists came the core of what became known as contemporary Indian art. Mm. Oh, wow. Um, and you know that today the IA, IA has survived and prospered. Yes, very much so. I don't know if you know that when it was first, when it first began, it was on the campus of the Santa Fe Indian School. Oh, yeah. And I will tell you where I live is like a, a block and a half uh, from the Santa Fe Indian School. So for a long time... I could, I could see my, my old dorm. I could see the academic building and I could see the sculptures and the murals on those buildings. And as you know, these were torn down. Yes. But I remember where they went. I remember where those buildings stood. So for years, I was able to see that. Um, well, you know, Karita, you are such an amazing, to me, you're a living legend. Just mm. the archives you have of the people you've met and what you've seen and all the, the years and generations of what IA has gone through from when it first uh, was founded, I believe, in 1964. Is that correct? No, 19, 1962 was the first year. Okay, so 1962 and then the change over to this, the old College of Santa Fe campus that was around 86, 87? Um, well, let me see. We became an AFA program in 1978. Oh, um, okay. I think we moved in 1980. Oh, really? The College of Santa Fe, maybe. Oh, wow. Okay. I could be wrong there because, you know, I didn't, I have that someplace, but maybe Diane knows yeah, um we'll uh, open up for everybody to come and join us in about 10 minutes but in the meantime so as a student do you want to talk more about your student time or do you want to talk about your career at ia because i want to hear about that let me think about um i will say you know since i mentioned 1978 i was uh fortunate enough to be on the, it was called the Native American Council of Regents. It was like the first board of trustees. And I was in Oklahoma at the time, but I took uh, T.C. Cannon's place. You know, he had passed wow. away. I, I will say that he was a student at IAIA when I was a student. And, um, I will also say that I maintained these connections all these years with many of the students I went to school with. TC was one of them. Oh, and, wow. and I had a, a long friendship with TC. I, I worked at Dartmouth College in 1972, 73. And uh, I had invited TC up there and the dean of the art school at Dartmouth had wanted Native artists to be in residence. So I had Fritz Shoulder there at Dartmouth for the interview, and I had T.C. Cannon there for the interview. So uh, we had a long history. Um, I had friends from IA 
who have since passed, good friends like Sherman Chattelson, who was an artist, and Benny Buffalo. And um, I consider them my brothers. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sherman Chattelson and I uh, went through the sixth grade on up together. So I knew him since the sixth grade. And I used to go visit him. Um, he lived several blocks from me in Lawton. And uh, I go conveniently around dinner time and, and just join them at the table. I was like one of their children. Mm. Uh, so there's these connections that go way back. And, and it's when I first uh, really learned about brotherhood brothers and sisters um and and there there were many artists who came out of ia yes. so i'm mentioning tc and sherman chattelson parker boydle we remain friends uh these became artists in that contemporary native art movement i was really fortunate to to know them to know them um back when we were in our teens. Oh, wow. Um, I thought I'd throw that in. Well, so. I sure hope you decide to write a book one day, uh, Carita, because you have such rich, rich, rich history that there's no way that Western culture, what they call civilization, can come through in, in gold or dollar amounts because your wealth is absolutely priceless. And I do hope that it gets written down somewhere, archived somewhere, and uh, all the amazing artists that you have met. So uh, tell us about your career at IAIA. Okay. Um, well, I've, I've had a long association with, with IA. As I said, I was on one of their, the IA's first boards. Um, but the way my career got started with IA is uh, after I finished my degree, my ceramics degree, degree at Oklahoma University, uh, I graduated in 1971. Uh, I got a degree in what was called ceramics design. Um, and after that, I got into graduate school at the University of New Mexico working on an MFA. I didn't finish that because a person I knew from Oklahoma um, called me and told me that Dartmouth was recruiting a staff member for their Native American programs mm -hmm. or program. So, you know, being a, a college student, I was without money. Um, I don't think I ever had a new car. And um, I, quit my MFA and took a job at Dartmouth College. Um, I went back to Oklahoma after spending time working at Dartmouth. And um, I actually was trained in art education. I went into that program. And then I got a master's degree in educational administration. And that was like in 1976 or 77. And at that time, making a living from my art, which is what I wanted to do, but I was insecure about that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, getting a master's degree in education was, was a backup. Right, right. After I finished that master's degree, I moved here to Santa Fe because I wanted to be a full-time artist. Um, so I came here in 1978 and I worked at the Santa Fe Indian Hospital until like 1980. I, in 1980, I got one of the first SWIA fellowships mm -hmm. and I was able to quit my job and I started doing art full-time. Wow. I did art full-time until around 1987. Um, I'd work out of my home 
And then I had a studio, I had a storefront in Corrales, New Mexico. Because I did my art full time, I knew a lot about the business. So I was asked to teach the business of art at IA. So that's how I got back at IA was teaching that one class. Um, I don't even know how long I taught that. Well, in 1986, I moved back to Oklahoma. Um, I, was, I was really burned out from doing art full time. And perhaps I'm one of the few artists who feels that, but I felt like I was on a treadmill. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had to do the same thing over and over to make a living because it would sell. It's what people wanted. And I couldn't experiment. So I moved back to Oklahoma and trying to stop the shows so I could stop producing. Um, and while I was in Oklahoma, I got a call from IA asking me if I would be the interim dean. Back then it was the dean of instruction. If I would be the interim dean because the IA was going through a transition from the Bureau of Indian Affairs hmm. to a new federally, federally chartered school. We would become one of three federally chartered schools in the US. So that's Howard University, Gallaudet, and IA were the only federally chartered school we get an appropriation direct from Congress. That's so awesome. for two and a half years, I was the interim dean. And I will say it was pretty tough because there were 18 teachers. I had to supervise, supervise 18 teachers. Uh, I had to do our budget and it was over 600,000 and I had to do it all by hand. Oh my God. Um, I remember one day, in doing that budget, I was off by 10 cents. So that 600 and something thousand, I was off by 10 cents. Mm. And one faculty member, Felix V. Hill, kept walking back and forth, His, he passed me, behind me. And what are you doing? And I told him I was off 10 cents and I was going to find it. So he comes back by and he gives me a dime. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been sitting there forever. Um, so after the IA, became, I, I don't know who said that, but after the <laughs> IA became federally chartered, then I was no longer needed as the interim dean. Hmm. And Lloyd New and James McGrath offered me the ceramics position. Well, he actually offered me two, the arts management or he wanted me to develop a program in arts management because I had done art full time or take the ceramics position because Ralph Partington, who was my teacher in high school, uh, took an early retirement. Mm. So many of those who were with the BIA for a number of years were offered full, uh, an early retirement. He took it, so they were without a teacher. That's how I became the ceramics teacher. Wow, that's amazing. So I had to learn how to teach ceramics in a college program from the ground up. And um, Ralph had taught wheel throwing. When I was in high school, I knew how to throw on the wheel. It's what I did in college. But as a full-time artist, I was hand building. Mm -hmm. I was making even things like uh, Comanche leggings in clay. Wow. Uh, I was making moccasins in clay. I was making shields in clay, uh, at plus vessels and, and, and different things. So, so I was hand building. And uh, I developed a curriculum that, that was really centered around hand building. Mm. And uh, 
a little bit around sculpture. But at that time, Audley Lolama was teaching, um, I don't know if she was teaching traditional pottery, but she taught hand building and she taught sculpture in, in high school. So she was, she was really great at that and continued to do that. So I don't think I had a, a big emphasis on sculpture. And actually, I always considered Audley Lolama um, the beginning of contemporary native ceramics. Oh, wow. I look at her as starting that whole movement. And she's had a lot of students come out of her program. Nathan Begay, um, I think Preston Duini, Jackie Stevens, and there's many more who continued hand building and not necessarily doing traditional pottery, but Jackie Stevens made huge uh, vessel forms and, uh, you know, different from the pottery produced in this region. Oh, wow. So I, I had to come up with a different curriculum. And I mentioned before that uh, when I was speaking with uh, Caleb, is yeah. that her name? Yeah, that, that you have to be a, a, a jack of all trades. You have to know all these different techniques. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what I did. I started teaching different techniques. Um, and then as I grew, because students taught me how to teach, mm -hmm. I, I started adding um, more about contemporary ceramics in the U.S., well, actually all over, and giving them that background because I thought, you know, they might just go on and work on an MFA. So I tried to give them this bigger background, um, including contemporary Native American ceramics, that history. Um, as you know, IA is accredited um, by two accredited, accredited, accrediting associations. One is the Higher Learning Commission. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called. It used to be the um, North Central. Oh, okay. But, but that's one of them. And then the other one's the uh, National Association Schools of Art and Design. Right. So uh, they call that NASAD. And there were a, lo a lot of um, requirements under that accreditation. Uh, this included, you know, the time you spent with students in the classroom. Um, so IA was, had been learning all of this from the time they developed the AFA program and then they developed the BFA program. And now I understand they will be doing an MFA program in studio arts. Yes. yes. So, so they, they've had this, these growing pains mm. and, and, and they also had ups and downs because of the funding from Congress. It, it depended on, on, on the administration, if it was a Republican administration or a Democrat, and in the midst of all of this, there's this development of curriculum for these degrees. So wow. I, had to, I had to follow the criteria set and then work in um, a way to bring out who the students were. Oh, boy. Um, so... I believed in honoring the uniqueness of the IA student, which meant that a majority of them were from um, a tribe from the US, some even from Canada, um, and native people from Alaska. And because I could not teach 
any one culture, you know, ceramics, and I couldn't teach, okay, you know, we're going to do Hopi ceramics, uh, Hopi pottery. It was finding a way to be inclusive of all Native people with clay medium. Wow. That's and the way that I was able to do that was by creating assignments, which we call problems. And I knew, because the students taught me, how long it would take a certain assignment. Um, and that's how I created my program is because they taught me. I knew, okay, if I, have, if I can get them to come in in the evening during open studio, then they can finish this in two weeks or in three weeks. And every problem they were given, it, they were, it was open to who they were. Right. It was open to their concerns, uh, their culture. And many addressed these problems, uh, made statements from a traditional, a more, and you know, what does traditional mean kind of thing, you know, but from their, what right. they consider to be more traditional standpoint. Right. And then some of them looked at it in a very different way, which was more uh, of a personal nature. And, and sometimes that meant that it was about living in a city. Right. Um, they had their own concerns and that's what made my class exciting. Mm, wow. Was yeah. all these different views uh, that, and each student was different. And, and they had criteria to every problem, but within that, it was really who they were. Uh, and I found that challenging, and I also found that very exciting. And um, I, had, I had gifted students. I had students who were, I think, I, I, a number of, even like Chanupa Luger, more talented than me. When he <laughs> first touched clay, I walked by him one time and I said, you make that look so natural. And he looked at me and he said, it feels natural. Oh, wow. So uh, I, I think that teaching at IA was one of the most exciting parts of my life. It could be grueling. I mean, 25 years. Imagine doing it 25 years. And I grew, I grew with them, I guess, you know, because yeah. they taught me. And uh, it was a lot of work, but it was one of the most rewarding experiences. Wow. I learned a lot about other tribes. Uh, and, and I will have to, I'm going to have to insert this because I have a brother, Wallace Coffey, who has emceed at powwows all over, all over the U.S. So he knows a lot of tribal customs. Uh, a lot of different tribes, but we were able to share that because I also knew students from different tribes. So, so we would both kind of compare notes sometimes. Um, <laughs> and, and it was actually a really good education for me because, because when a project was completed and they had to speak about it, I learned not only about them, and their interests, their concerns, and sometimes about their tribe. Um, That's amazing, Karita. So I, I saw myself, especially like in the last five years or more, I saw myself as more of a collaborator and a facilitator. I had seniors uh, like Laura Walking Stick, for instance, who was primarily in ceramics. And uh, part of being a teacher is, is being able to draw out of them a little more. So, uh, you know, talking art with them and, and talking um, how they had to 
immerse themselves in this. And I would tell them, I'd always tell them, sleep on it. So we talk about if they got stuck someplace, we would talk it through. So I was kind of a collaborator. Um, and believe it or not, some of them actually took my input. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> uh, so again, um, I, I see that as one of my best experiences. Um, do you have any questions about that? Yeah, well, gosh, Karita, that just uh, reminds me of this last Saturday, Keith Sokola's concert, where he talked about the hierophany, that place in between, you know, yes, yes, um, heaven and earth and dark and light and uh, beautiful stuff like that. But now that we're uh, almost to the top of the hour, Karita. Thank you so much. I have so many more questions for you, but I want to invite the uh, audience in after Elena makes a commercial break announcement and we'll invite everybody in to say some hellos to you and ask you some questions. There's a couple of IAIA former uh, teachers and staff here tonight. So, uh, so I... thanks for that, Tash. Um, and thank you also, Karita, and what you've shared, just filling in so much history. Uh, next Wednesday, which is the 27th, we're going to have Teddy Draper Jr. from the Navajo Nation. He is an award-winning painter, jeweler, and, uh, and amazing, amazing artist. So he'll be with us in the circle. So please come and join us. Um, and also, you know, this recording is available in the next 48 hours on our website, uh, which is indigenousways.org. There you will see over 70 Native American, Indigenous, LGBTQIA, 2 plus artists, presenters who have been sharing in the circle when we started the 1st of April, getting connected. Uh, this is all possible thanks to our incredible uh, sponsors who have made all of our virtual events free. And we also provide ASL interpreters making access available to all. So thank you to Native America Advice Fund, the Santa Fe Community Foundation, West Staff and New Mexico Arts. Also thank you to the amazing individual artists that have also uh, allowed us to make this format possible where we could all come in, whether you're watching the recording of this or watching this live. Please um, join our newsletter, which will tell you all the amazing artists that are coming up, the amazing things we're doing. We're putting on an indigenous healing festival uh, in a few months. We'll tell you more about that. If you're watching us live in all our amazing virtual events or social media, please be sure to click on and like uh, any of those uh, pages. Also, uh, we have a donate page. If you have the funds to be able to do that, there's all the information there. This is that wonderful time. If you are out in the Zoom room, we're just gonna ask you uh, if you want to come and join us, turn your uh, cameras on, you may have a question. I mean, there were so many amazing archives of what Karita has said. While people are turning on their cameras uh, in social media, we had Leslie Burnett from Arthur, North Dakota saying, Karita, thank you for sharing your history and wisdom. I was struck by your comment about not knowing your family was poor until you left your homeland beautiful truth about the power of perspective and truth, truth being. You were not poor. You had the abundance of your beautiful family, legacy, history, and culture. There's also another, uh, uh, there's another uh, message She's also here. in social media from Terry Gomez. She's right there. Uh, who says, yes. It's true, 50% of my education came from other students. And she says, write a book. So if you're in social media, you're unable to do this, please uh, put questions into uh, the box yeah. and, and we'll read it. Yes, and now let's, uh, 
open it up. Who wants to get started? Shall we go down the list? Diane Reyna, would you like to unmute and say Hi, something Diane. to Karita? Diane! <laughs> <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo. Hey, it's good to see you. Hey, Karita. It's a, what a wonderful thing to get a call from for an invitation to come come oh, to this goodness. gathering so i'm really, i'm thrilled i've just you know i've been spending all day watching the news you know so this oh, yes, is yes. me out so it's a it's a pleasure to see you karita uh we also go back a long way yes uh, you were the one who got me involved in iaia uh faculty matters and uh got me on that path of administration so thank you for it's good to see you. Diane. I don't know if I should thank you or not, you know, but uh, it, yeah, I know. Well, both, uh, uh. there's a downside upside to everything. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's like hard, so, work, yeah, so, hard work, you know? Yeah, well, well it's thank good you. to see you. Nice it's to see years. you. Yes, it has. All right, hey, let's go on to uh, Missy. Yes, yes. I wanted to say hi, Karita. I, it's so great hi. to see you here tonight. And I was looking forward to this because I really have enjoyed um, just knowing you. And, and I was Thank sad you. when you moved to Oklahoma because I really enjoyed seeing you around and, and talking with you. And, and, you know, I love hearing about your rich history of your Comanche tribe and your name, working with hands, good with her hands. And and your your last name coffee how that got interpreted and just it's just so cool what what great names and that you have to carry into your life to your you know um just all your rich history that you've had since you were born you know into this world and and um i didn't know a lot about the iaia history and i really enjoyed those old pictures um just amazing yeah. amazing amazing yeah. pictures and I didn't know that IAIA was a high school and postgraduate program that it started out that way. I thought it was always like a college, you know, and then, you know, and that it was a federally, only one of three federally chartered, chartered schools in the United States. And I mean, just, just the way you went through everything and explained and then just all your stories, even from grade school and having three grades in a class and it just you know for me I can relate to a lot of stuff that you talked about just because coming from that Indian history and knowing about, about my family and and the stories I've heard you know and I know my mom who's here tonight under Harry and Kathy she oh. can probably relate to a lot of it a lot of your stories and um so so I just you know I just think it's really neat and so now, now that um, you're in Oklahoma. She's back um, in Santa Fe, miss. Or are you back in Santa Fe? Yeah, I, I moved back here. Oh my God. Actually, my brother and I owned my mother's house and we sold it and it was the Comanche tribe that, that bought her house. Oh. Uh, wow. So I moved, I moved back here. You know, this is my second home. Kind, yes. of, kind, of, kind of the first and a half. <laughs> uh -huh. They have a long history out here. So yes. and I have I have friends out here. And then my daughter lives in Albuquerque. So I'm back and I and it's it's where I want to be, where I need to be. And uh yeah, I'm back here, Michelle. I hope I get to see you. Oh yeah, you will. I'm gonna yes, be looking you, you up for sure. And that's awesome <laughs> that you're back in Santa Fe. Well, okay, so you're back in Santa Fe, and uh, are you going to get back into your artwork, or what are you doing while you're here? I, I hope so. Um, I, I did some artwork while I was in Oklahoma and, and felt like I hit on something in clay, um, and I, I don't, I'm still working that out, you know, how I'm going to do that and where I'm going to do that. Um, I, I really don't, um, I don't want to think about like making art to sell. I, yeah. I want to have fun now. So uh, yes, I will be, I will be doing artwork. Awesome. Great, Thank you very great. Much well, that. I can't wait to see what you come up with. Looking forward to what's next. Thanks, miss. Let's go to Rachelle. Rachelle just graduated from IA a year or two ago, and she was asking about you, Karita. So what's oh, up? Yes. Hey, Rachelle. 
Hi, good evening, Karita. Um, I was spoken with, um, speaking with Linda Loma Heftawa the other day, and um, I'm actually doing research on Adelie Loloma. Yes. And she's the topic of my master's paper that I'm working on right now. And um, I really appreciate your input. Although I, I like that you um, pointed out um, Ralph Partington being your ceramics teacher. Did you take any instruction from Adelie? No, Loloma? no, no? I, I didn't get to do that. Um, okay. No, and I knew her but, and, and knew her as a teacher uh, and, and knew some of her students, but no, I, I didn't get to take a, a course. And, from and um, um, Linda shared how you two are like the Josephine Wap and Audley Loloma of today, her being <laughs> Hopi and you being Comanche. <laughs> you know, I'm glad she said that. That is so funny. Um, I mean, it really is. We are, I guess yeah. we are. And uh, I think of course, Linda and I are, are still friends the way that Audley and Josephine were friends for a long time. That, that is so funny. I have to talk to Linda about that. Did you get the, the picture I sent Linda of Audley and Josephine? Yes, yes. And that one is also in archives. I uh, entered a photo in the chat session for everybody. And I found that image of, of Audley when she was younger with Lloyd and it was the Fashion Council in Scottsdale oh, in the oh, 50s, wow. like 56 wow. or 57. So I'm, I'm trying to research the root of that, but I, I really appreciate um, your remarks and they're gonna be helpful to my- um, Oh my gosh. My, um, yeah, that's the and first Charles. time <gasps> And Charles Loloma. Yes. Cool. And, Oddly, isn't and she the, beautiful? Yes. Oh. And um, I appreciate all your input and- um, who knows, I might be calling you real soon because my deadline's coming up. <laughs> you're so if you're available, welcome. that is. I you're think so Linda welcome. said she got permission and she got um, past your info on, but um, I'm really grateful. I, I thought it was serendipitous that this um, Zoom session is on now and you're, I'm like, oh, I gotta make sure I catch you speaking this evening. And um, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Have a good, good evening. You, Shells. Thank good to you. see you, Shells. And Shells also a board member for Indigenous Ways, also. So thank you good. for being here tonight, Rachel. Very and let's good. hear let, let's hear from Terry Gomez. Terry Gomez. Hi there, Madelve. Madelve, Karita. Madelve. I think you should write a book. Oh. Uh, you know, it's, it's like writing or taking a test is kind of the last thing I want to do <laughs> I <hear you. laughs> after, after teaching all those years. Yeah, I hear you, but um, there are ways to do it and your information is really valuable. And uh, I think it would be good to put it up there and uh, help us because, um, you know, we really need a lot of textbooks and a lot of reference books by Native people. As many as we're starting to have, there still isn't nearly enough. And you have such a wealth of uh, information there. I think it would be really valuable. And uh, I don't know, maybe the Institute can help you, help you put it together. So that might be something worth looking into. Well, thank you. Yeah, you're still as beautiful as ever. I used to see her. She was a little bit older than I was at the powers. A lot older, Terry. I'd be like, oh my gosh, that woman is so beautiful. Thank uh, you. You still are. So tell your mother thing. hello for me. I'm very, very fond of your mother. I will. She very turned fond. 85 um, on the 4th of January. Still really sharp. Wow. So she's doing well. Well, I'm very All fond right. of her. I'll talk to you later. Okay. That's awesome. Real quick, I just got to read this Carrie. comment here on one of our social media pages. It's from Carrie Holcomb. Yes, I'll love to know what's their opinion about controversial in bear hunt statue. 
And uh, this question is also related to a situation. Uh, I'm going to just repeat. Angelina Owillo out of Seattle is asking you this, Karita. I'm in a situation where there's a large deaf community who want to keep a beautiful bronze statue of two male uh, Americans uh, with only a, a lion clothing covering their groan, groins fighting with a bear in front of two cubs in 1892. There was an Elma deaf artist who made that art. It landed between administration and early childhood education building where many deaf infants watch our stories. It was raised as racism by our two deaf Americans, as we know it called the bear hunt until the author named uh, the death grip through his documents at the library. I personally can't allow the cover up. Uh, what do you suggest? And uh, it's about a, a statue that's up that's controversial. Do you have any input or would you like more information on that? Yeah, I don't really know. Um, you know, that's happening all over today. Okay. And um, I think it's wise to listen to people. Um, what we find offensive today, um, which actually we have probably found offensive for a long time, but other people haven't. Mm. So I, I, I really... Um, I, I really don't know. It to me, it kind of sounds a little. I don't know, kind of like a more of a relic. Um. So, I I really I I don't know. Maybe someone else can can answer that, or would like to answer that. No. Okay. Okay, well, um, we're kind of running out of time here. So um, I just want to kind of wrap this up real quick. One last uh, comment uh, from Caleb Wolf, the Seminole from uh, the IA student. She's asking you, what is your advice in becoming a ceramist in the future? Hmm. Um. Well, I, I would say uh, starting out, uh, getting to know techniques, getting to know the technical stuff, which sometimes it's not the fun stuff. Um, uh, you know, learn about clay because there's different kinds of clays um, so that you can be independent, how to fire your own work, no matter what method that is. But, but I would just say uh, getting a good, a good technical background and to go where you need to go to get that, to get that kind of education. Awesome. Thank you for that, Karita. And uh, our beautiful folks, we're out of time. I want to just take this time to thank everyone for beaming in live, whether you came in through the Zoom platform or through our multitudes of social media or you're watching the recording of this thank you so much for your time and energy and you know what i was thinking with uh how it was happening with our beautiful audience participation that's the indigenous way it's all family it's unity we're thriving and our purpose we do that all together so uh thank you for that also thank you making <coughs> it possible for access to all our beautiful interpreters. We have uh, Kay Lee, who's with us, and also Chris Sessiando, uh, who was interpreting earlier. Thank you, uh, making that possible. And also, let's give it up for the beautiful Corita Coffee. Ooh. Touch the earth, touch the earth.